Okay. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the uh, last day of the uh, conference. And uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our morning plenary speaker, Professor Rob Martinson. Rob is a professor at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and is also a Howard Hughes Medical Institute and Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation investigator in plant biology. I think many of you, I'm sure most of you know Rob, he's truly one of the very best plant scientists in the world. He's done pioneering work on epigenetics and plant epigenetics for many years, um, working on epigenetic mechanisms that shape and regulate the genome and looking at their impact on development and inheritance. Um, his work on transport, so just a couple of you know, notable uh, points about Rob. His work on transposable elements in plants and repetitive sequences in DNA, and, I mean in fission yeast, revealed a link between heterochromatin and RNA interference. And for, for this, he received the AAAS Newcomb Award, Newcomb Cleveland Award in 2003. It's quite a prestigious award. His work was also cited by the journal Science as part of its breakthrough of the year 2002 feature on small RNAs. I also, I remember when uh, Jura and I and Rob were in a conference in Brazil and drinking together. I, I think it sounded like he had one of the more intimidating job interviews when he came to Cold Spring Harbor around 1986. He said the interview committee was three Nobel Prize winners, Jim Watson, Barbara McClintock, and I forget the, the, third, the third one. So that's a, quite an experience. So as you can, I've already alluded to and mentioned some of his awards. He's received a number of others. Just want to touch on some of the major ones. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 2006 and elected a member of EMBO in 2010. And in 2018, he was awarded the McClintock Prize, which recognizes the most outstanding plant geneticist of the present era. As a McClintock Prize recipient, uh, he joins an elite group of only four other plant geneticists that have received this award. So without further ado, Rob, come on up. Thank you so much, Leon and, and Morris, for the uh, invitation. And uh, also, I, I just have to say, I'm pretty sure this is the furthest north I've ever given a talk on Midsummer's Day. <laughs> Uh, so we'll see how it goes, but it really was impressive that it was light at four o'clock this morning. Uh, <laughs> all right, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, germline reprogramming and epigenetic inheritance. In, in many ways, these are like two sides of the same coin. So, so all plants and animals have to reset epigenetic marks in the, in the zygote, in the germline, uh, before fertilization. Uh, in order to be able to make the zygote totipotent again. You have to lose all the stuff that happened in development, all the things that might have been imposed by the environment in order to be able to start again. Uh, and uh, 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 as a result, epigenetic inheritance actually has a severe barrier uh, through reprogramming. It's only when reprogramming fails in a way uh, that epigenetic inheritance results. But in fact, epigenetic inheritance is quite common in plants, so common that uh, I always like to start my talks with this iconic portrait of Luther Burbank, who, uh, of course, was a, a, a plant breeder and a socialite uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And he uh, famously wrote this essay uh, just after the rediscovery of genetics in which he claimed that heredity was only the sum of all past environment. He didn't believe in genetics, which is a pretty weird thing for a plant breeder. Uh, but, uh, of course, he was wrong. Uh, but it did, it did lead to this iconic and actually posthumous portrait of Luther from uh, Frida Kahlo. It's an amazing portrait. I've seen this. Uh, in, in, I've actually seen the portrait. Uh, uh, and you can see that he's, uh, you know, he's just taking his, uh, without any sort of reprogramming, this is the sort of dead body of Luther Burbank, which is feeding this uh, human plant. Uh, well, of course, uh, 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 he was wrong. Uh, but in fact, epigenetic inheritance is quite common in plants, much more common than it is in animals. And for a work of people like uh, Alexander Brink and, of course, Barbara McClintock in the 1940s really demonstrated for many, many genes and transposable elements the ability to inherit a different state in the next generation that was truly epigenetic. Uh, and, of course, in plants, uh, we can go, uh, completely ignore uh, germline reprogramming very easily uh, to produce clones, and clonal propagation is very, very common, of, of course, in plants. It's been practiced for thousands of years. It's recently become possible in animals, uh, and, uh, and uh, actually my uh, former Canadian student, Joe Colaco, who was a huge movie buff, put this, uh, put this slide together uh, for me. But, 
Uh, in fact, clones are not identical. Even though they have the same exact genetic makeup, if you don't do germline reprogramming, you get interesting, very important epigenetic variation. We call it somaclonal variation in plants, uh, and I'll be, uh, I'll, be, I'll be talking a lot more about that uh, later on. But when we think about uh, uh, gene, uh, germline reprogramming in plants, of course, uh, the, uh, by far the uh, easiest uh, place to look at it is in the pollen, and that's what we've been doing for many years now. Uh, just to remind you, of course, you all know this, pollen has uh, two cell types. There are the two sperm cells, uh, which uh, are, uh, are responsible for double fertilization, so they contribute their DNA to the next generation. Uh, and then there's a vegetative nucleus. You can think of this like a companion cell that uh, supports pollen tube growth, very important for fertilization, but doesn't contribute its DNA to the next generation. Uh, when we think of epigenetic mechanisms of reprogramming, there are many, of course. Uh, the most important, probably, both in plants and mammals, is DNA methylation. I'll be talking a lot about that. Uh, but there's also histone modifications and histone variants. I'm actually not going to talk about that today, but we do do a lot of work on that. Uh, and very importantly, small RNAs. And this is really going to be uh, a big focus of uh, what I'm going to talk about today. All right, small RNAs. Uh, in plants, uh, come in, uh, in many different uh, uh, shapes and sizes. Uh, we can think of, we can group them in Arabidopsis at least into two uh, size class or two different uh, biogenesis classes. The first are generated from single stranded precursors. These, of course, are microRNAs. MicroRNAs are found in animals and plants. They target genes. They're extremely important for development of biology. Uh, in plants, they're typically 21, sometimes 22 nucleotides in size. But short interfering RNAs are actually the bulk of the small RNAs in a plant cell. Uh, and these are generated uh, by RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And so they are uh, double-stranded precursors. And those double-stranded precursors are also uh, processed by DICER. And they, uh, depending on the DICER, they can be either 24 or 21 nucleotides in size. 24 nucleotide small RNAs <coughs> come typically from transposons. Transposons and repeats, uh, that's not entirely true in all plant species, but certainly in Arabidopsis. The vast majority of 24 nucleotide small RNAs come from transposons. There are, however, 21s as well. These come from uh, non-coding RNAs. We sometimes call them transacting uh, small RNAs. They also target genes. Uh, in Arabidopsis, there aren't that many of them, uh, but in, uh, in, in some plants, there are a lot more. And these, uh, these 21s will become important shortly. The 24s, this is a complicated slide. You don't have to remember any of it. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's the work of many, many different labs over the last 15 years or so, uh, demonstrating that the 24 nucleotide type of small RNAs that come from transposons and repeats can actually uh, program DNA methylation. Uh, they do this uh, using a whole uh, host of factors, uh, including some plant-specific RNA polymerases, POL4 and POL5, uh, some uh, histone uh, lysine 9 methyltransferases, some DNA methyltransferases, and of course, DICER argonaut and RDRP. Uh, and each one of these factors is absolutely required for the production of these 24 nucleotide small RNAs and for the, uh, 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 the DNA methylation that they guide. So you might imagine that if you were to take away these factors, that transposons would become activated. Uh, and in fact, uh, that's not really the case in Arabidopsis. Maybe 2 or 3% of transposons uh, are directly regulated in this way, but most of them stay silent, even when you uh, remove these 24s. And the reason for that is that Plants, like animals, can maintain DNA methylation without any other additional information. And this is really what epigenetics is all about. It's the ability to inherit uh, through uh, the cell cycle uh, uh, epigenetic marks purely on the basis that they're there. Okay? So it's uh, without RNA or anything else. Uh, and uh, uh, many years ago now, uh, actually many, many years ago now, uh, Eric Richards and I did a screen for DNA methylation mutants in Arabidopsis. It was a brute force screen by, by Southern Blotting. No one knows how to do Southern Blots anymore, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's what we did. And uh, there were two uh, confrontation groups that had lost DNA methylation uh, based, based on restriction enzymes. Uh, decrease in DNA methylation 1 and DDM2. DDM2 uh, encodes a DNA methyltransferase, MET1. This is actually the homologue of mammalian, DNMT1 does exactly the same thing. It is the maintenance DNA methyltransferase. Uh, but DDM1 is actually a chromatin remodeler. Again, I'm not going to talk about that side of DDM1 at all today. Uh, but it's not a DNA methyltransferase. Again, it has an excellent mammalian homologue, uh, LSH1, in the mouse, uh, past G in humans, uh, which does exactly the same thing, which is to uh, control DNA methylation of heterochromatin specifically. In both these mutants, uh, we get a ton of transposon RNA. Basically, all transposons come on, 
uh, and, they're, and they're very strongly expressed. But amazingly enough, in Arabidopsis, uh, these plants are perfectly viable, uh, which is completely different from mammals where uh, these mutants are, are very early lethals. So uh, something is keeping these plants alive uh, in Arabidopsis. Uh, well, one idea was that maybe RNAi has something to do with that, and so Zach, Zach Lippmann, when he was a, a, a graduate student uh, with me many years ago, uh, did some uh, uh, northern blots. Again, no one does these anymore, but uh, northern blots looking for transpose on small RNAs in uh, DDM1 and MET1 mutants and also other, other types of chromatin mutants. And what he found was that 24 nucleotide small RNAs, which are associated with DNA methylation, typically go down in these mutants, and that's more or less what you'd expect. Uh, but a new class of small RNAs, 21 nucleotides in size, were found specifically in MET1 and DDM1 mutants. Uh, they corresponded to some but not all transposable elements, uh, and, uh, and they were extremely abundant and very specific to these mutants. Uh, we called these epigenetically activated or easy RNAs, uh, and in many ways they resemble these 21 nucleotide small RNAs that I was talking about in the beginning, sometimes called transacting small RNAs. Uh, transacting small RNAs and easy RNAs, it uh, turns out, uh, Keith Slotkin went on to show when he joined the lab, uh, uh, use exactly the same biogenesis pathway. That's to say they use a particular argonaut, a particular dicer, and a particular RDRP uh, to generate uh, these small RNAs. And just like uh, 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 transacting small RNAs, they also use microRNAs uh, to trigger the whole process. And I don't want to go into all of that, all of that detail, but uh, it's very important that you have to have a microRNA to determine the specificity for this, uh, for this, for this whole process. And it turns out these easy RNAs uh, also use microRNAs uh, as a trigger. Uh, they actually use almost all microRNAs in Arabidopsis. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So uh, as if microRNAs had really evolved uh, to target transposons uh, originally and not, not so much genes. Uh, and, they, and they generate these huge amounts of easy RNAs, but not from every single transposon. And so, uh, okay, Chrissy, and she was in the lab, did some sequencing uh, a few years ago and showed that, sure enough, in a DDM1 mutant, uh, we see this uh, huge uh, increase in these 21 nucleotide small RNAs, and they come from a whole different series of transposons, but the transposons are, are selected, if you like, simply by the fact that they are recognized by, by microRNAs. You might be wondering what happened to the plants. Uh, if you make these double mutants between DDM1 and RNAi, and sure enough, we see very strong, uh, actually really pleiotropic and, 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 and drastic phenotypes now when we make these double mutants. There are a lot of them are lethal. The DDM1 early R6 double mutants are actually quite interesting. We, we now think we understand what's going on here, but I, I don't have time to tell you that. Uh, but nonetheless, clearly these easy RNAs are indeed keeping these mutants uh, alive. Okay, so given that we have this pathway uh, to generate, uh, you know, uh, thousands of, of transposon uh, small RNAs in DDM1 mutants, surely there should be some uh, aspect of, of, of normal development where this pathway operates, and not just in mutants that we make in the lab. And so Keith, when he was in the lab, uh, he uh, did a very simple uh, experiment. He just looked online uh, for uh, microarray data that uh, uh, included transposon expression. Uh, and uh, this is from the Detlef uh, Vigel's lab. And what, they, uh, what he found was that, indeed, transposons are very silent throughout most of plant development. You probably can't read this here, but th these are all different developmental stages, and transposons really are silent. But there are two places where they come on, once in the pollen and once in the immature seed. And this, of course, is exactly where you don't want them to come on, so it's sort of weird uh, <laughs> that plants can keep them silent so well, but, but not there. Uh, well... <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me, got some more. Um, Keith went on to show uh, that the reason for this was that transposons are actually expressed not in the sperm cells, but in the in the vegetative nucleus. <coughs> and the reason for this is that the vegetative nucleus has lost heterochromatin. Uh, you can see this in this dappy stain pollen grain Arabidopsis. Here are the two sperm cells with very condensed chromatin, uh, but the vegetative nucleus has really lost heterochromatin altogether, stained with dappy. And part of the reason, at least for that, is it doesn't express DDM1. So DDM1 is very strongly expressed in the sperm cells, this GFP fusion, but not in the vegetative nucleus. And again, this was all published a few years ago now. Uh, Keith went on to do a lot of uh, sequencing and other sorts of experiments uh, and came up with this model where what we think is happening is that uh, reprogramming of the heterochromatin in the vegetative nucleus turns on transposons deliberately, if you like. It sort of fools them 
into expressing themselves in a place that doesn't matter because the DNA doesn't get into the next generation. But by expressing them, it can now target them for small RNA production, and those small RNAs accumulate, interestingly, in the sperm cells. They seem to move, and, and Keith has gone, he has his own lab now in Ohio uh, State University. He had a beautiful paper last year <laughs> demonstrating that they really do move, uh, uh, as, as we hypothesized at the time, from the vegetative cell into the sperm cell. So they accumulate in the sperm cells, where now they can silence transposons if they are lucky enough uh, to, uh, to, to turn on. And so this then, uh, this then we think is, a, is, a, is, is sort of one function of reprogramming uh, in, in, uh, in plants. Uh, you might be asking yourself, well, this is all very well in pollen, but which microRNA might be responsible uh, for targeting transposons? And Philippe, uh, Philippe Borges, who was a postdoc in there for many years, he's just, just started his own lab in Paris. We're all incredibly jealous. Uh, uh, so uh, Philippe uh, uh, did uh, small RNA sequencing from pollen and discovered that uh, one of the most abundant, probably the second most abundant microRNA in pollen is called MIR 845. It comes in two size classes, 21 and 22. And you can see from these read numbers, it's, it's massively abundant in pollen. Uh, if you take a, a, a MIR 845 target site and put it in a GFP reporter gene, you get lots and lots of easy RNAs. So it can, the MIR 845 can generate uh, easy RNAs in the, in the way that you might expect. Interestingly, it's polymorphic. Uh, in Colombia, for example, if you take that reporter gene, express it everywhere in the plant, it's expressed everywhere in the plant except in the pollen, and that's because of MIR845, which silences the reporter gene. But in Landsberg, uh, which is a very commonly used uh, other accession of Arabidopsis, uh, that doesn't happen. And the reason, and uh, pollen expresses very, the reporter very strongly, and the reason for that is Landsberg has lost this microRNA. It's polymorphic. It actually is polymorphic among Arabidopsis accessions. Uh, which I'll get back to. It's actually sort of surprising that that would be true. Um, uh, and, and, and indeed, MIR-845 targets transposons. It does so in a really uh, uh, amazing way. So you probably don't think about retrotransposons every day of the week, uh, but it was shown in the 1980s that retrotransposons uh, replicate uh, using a tRNA primer that binds to something called the primer binding site. The primer binding site is 18 nucleotides in size. Uh, it's absolutely conserved uh, for transposons because they need, they absolutely need it to replicate. So cDNA synthesis starts with this tRNA primer and needs that primer binding site. So in order for a transposon to survive, it can't mutate the PBS. And that's exactly what this microRNA targets. And it targets it extremely uh, accurately. Uh, and furthermore, most plant transposons use exactly the same uh, primer binding, uh, uh, tRNA, and therefore very similar primer binding sites. And so uh, this microRNA manages to target almost all the wretched transposons in the genome at the one site that they can't mutate and can't evolve. Uh, we're fortunate to have mutants uh, that have uh, uh, down-regulated or, or, or blocked expression of this microRNA. And when we do that, we see a, a loss of all of the pollen uh, small RNAs. So in black here in wild type, you can see that in pollen, we have lots and lots of 22s, uh, uh, nucleotide small RNAs, 21s, and they are, they are largely abolished in a mutant that's lost this microRNA. And the mutant isn't, oh, I'll show you in a moment, it's not complete mutant, uh, but it does lose most of these small RNAs. Uh, and in fact, we can, uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can look at that in a different way. Here is a little cartoon of a transposon with the LTR, long terminal repeat, and the primer binding site. And you can see uh, that in Colombia, uh, we have lots and lots of 21 and 22 nucleotide small RNAs coming from that LTR, uh, and, and, and relatively few 24s. Whereas in Landsberg, uh, we don't see that. So Landsberg can't make these 21s and 22s. If we make a mutant of Columbia that loses that microRNA, we lose the 21s and 22s. If we put the microRNA back transgenically into Landsberg, now we get the 21s and 22s. So indeed, this microRNA is responsible for easy RNA production. You might notice, if you have a sharp eye, that um, uh, here I've also included uh, small RNA sequencing data from diploid pollen. So of course, pollen is usually haploid, but tetraploid plants produce diploid pollen. And interestingly, it seems to be dose dependent. So the amount of these 21s and 22s goes up pretty dramatically in diploid pollen. The reason I did that is because it turns out that this whole pathway is responsible uh, for something uh, that was discovered at Cold Spring Harbor almost exactly 100 years ago, and which you're probably more familiar with than they are with small RNAs. Uh, uh, this is the triploid block. Uh, 
So Albert Blakesley, of course, uh, was working with Jimson weed initially, and thought he discovered a new species, which was this uh, Jimson weed uh, uh, mutant uh, that could absolutely uh, self-fertilize without a problem, but couldn't cross, be back crossed back to its progenitor. And he initially thought this was a new thing. He was working in the Station for Experimental Evolution. That was uh, 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 Colspring Howard's old name. And, uh, uh, and, and he really thought he had a new species. And then suddenly he did a chromosome spread and realized it was a tetraploid. And, and, the, and the reason that it couldn't be back crossed is because triploids, triploids die. And so, uh, you know, this is actually taken from that paper. It's, a, it's, 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 it's a, his sort of mental Punnett square going through what, what, what really happens with triploids. So almost all plants, angiosperms, do this. Uh, they, they have a very strong uh, 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 system uh, that, that essentially kills triploid seed. And, and, and it's thought that the reason for this is that triploids, of course, can't do meiosis uh, properly. And so if gametes from triploid plants found their way into the population, you'd have a lot of problems and it would be very bad news for the plants. So triploids have this programmed uh, death. This works very nicely in Arabidopsis, uh, and in fact, in Arabidopsis, you can, uh, oops, sorry. In Arabidopsis, uh, you can use mutants in meiosis. Uh, this is a mutant called emission of second division that make diploid pollen even from a diploid plant. Okay, so it's just a meiotic mutant. It's just a convenient tool to make diploid pollen. When you do that, uh, uh, you get a you know, massive uh, seed uh, death. Uh, however, this doesn't happen in Landsberg. Uh, in Landsberg, you get perfectly viable seed, amazingly. And it's probably something to do with the frequency of tetraploids in Arabidopsis. I'm not an ecologist, but uh, I think it would be very interesting. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, we may used our mutant now uh, in, uh, in MIR-845 to see if MIR-845 was responsible. And sure enough, it was. So in the MIR-845 mutant, we lose conveniently about half of the microRNA. It's not a null mutant, but we, uh, we lose about half of the microRNA. And we restore uh, seed germination to a, 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 a diploid pollen from Columbia. So indeed, this microRNA is responsible for the triploid block. I should say this has all been a collaboration with Claudia Kurler, who's like the queen of the triploid block. She's in Sweden, in Uppsala, and she's gone on to show that many mutants in this pathway have this phenotype or even stronger. Uh, so it really looks like this easy RNA pathway has evolved, if you like, to count chromosomes, uh, to tell how many chromosomes uh, there are and, and, and react appropriately. Okay, so, uh, so what about reprogramming then? How does all of this happen? Uh, many years ago now, uh, we, uh, uh, we set about trying to sequence uh, the methylome of pollen uh, uh, in Arabidopsis, uh, which we did by, by purifying uh, uh, two uh, stages, the, the microspore, which is the haploid product of meiosis, of course, uh, but also the vegetative nucleus and the sperm cells. And we purify them using a sorting. I'm not gonna go into details. This was all published a few years ago. Uh, and we got enough material to be able to do, to sequence the methylation uh, of the genome uh, using bisulfite sequencing. This is what that data looked like. I mean, it's very much a bird's eye view. Uh, just to remind you, there are different types of DNA methylation in plants. Uh, we have symmetric CG methylation, uh, which is just like it is in animals uh, and, uh, and can be maintained in the way that I described using uh, MET1 and other things. Uh, but there's also uh, other types of uh, DNA methylation, non-CG methylation, which are guided either by chromatin or, as I mentioned at the beginning, by RNAi. Uh, now, if we, uh, if we look at the methylation map, these are the five chromosomes of Arabidopsis. Uh, heat map, DNA high DNA methylation is in red. Uh, we can see that not really, not very much is happening. And, and that, that, is, that is very important. So CG methylation doesn't really change in the germline. And that's totally different from mammals, where it's completely erased and completely restored twice, actually, in the mammalian life cycle. So in plants, they maintain DNA methylation through the germline. And that might explain why epigenetic inheritance is much more common in plants than it is in animals, and why people like Brink and McClintock were able to demonstrate paramutation and so on. It's simply because it's not reprogrammed in that way. But uh, non-CG methylation, especially this type of methylation, H is anything but G, so, so uh, asymmetric methylation does get reprogrammed. It's lost in the microscope, it's lost in the sperm cells, but it comes back like the clappers in the embryo. So this really does get reprogrammed, and it's genome-wide, and it's big. So it's the RNA-dependent type of DNA methylation that's reprogrammed in the plant germline. Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, that leads you to wonder what happens uh, when you don't reprogram the germline. 
So, of course, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, in plants, we're very, very uh, comfortable with the idea of cloning. You know, reproductive cloning in plants is not, uh, not as uh, controversial as it is in, in animals, let alone humans. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we all are for, very familiar with sorts of uh, epigenetic variation that happen uh, in, 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 in clones. So in Arabidopsis, you can make uh, suspension cell cultures. Uh, they're difficult to make, but once you make them, they look fine. They're deployed. Uh, they can be maintained for a very long time. Uh, and uh, and uh, we've uh, recently, uh, and, and I don't have a lot of the data on this, this is unpublished so far, we've recently done some bisulfite sequencing of uh, uh, cell cultures, and not just cell cultures, but different stages of the cell cycle, so S phase, G1, and so on. And I'm not going to get into that detail, I'm just going to point out that uh, in pollen, we lose CHH methylation in the germline, sperm cells and microspore, that's what that black uh, line is. And we basically see the same thing in cell culture. We lose that uh, uh, non-CG methylation. Even though CG methylation, even after 20 years in culture, uh, is, is, is still more or less maintained. So it looks a lot like germline reprogramming, only without the fertilization to restore that DNA methylation. So what happens then in clones, uh, that, uh, 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 that in clonal cell cultures uh, with respect to easy RNAs? Uh, it turns out, and uh, this is, uh, I've overanimated this slide, uh, but it turns out that just like in pollen, we see lots and lots of 21 nucleotide small RNAs from specific transposons. Uh, uh, the same transposons that get targeted in pollen are targeted uh, in cell cultures, and they produce lots and lots of easy RNAs, whereas other transposons don't. Uh, so it really looks like reprogramming is happening in cell culture, but without fertilization. Okay. So, of course, this uh, could lead to real-world issues uh, when uh, plants are propagated through uh, cyclonal, uh, uh, or through micropropagation, through tissue culture. Uh, and one of the, uh, one of the most famous uh, uh, or infamous uh, 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 tissue culture systems is the oil palm. Uh, back in the 1970s uh, and 80s, uh, Unilever uh, uh, put a huge amount of money into uh, the, the Malaysian oil palm business. Uh, to uh, develop cloning. So oil palm breeding hasn't uh, had a lot of time, and so they have elite hybrids that have way more yield than anything else, and of course you can't, you know, you can't take the seed from that hybrid, but you can clone it. And so uh, Unilever developed this, uh, this technology that allowed you to take, uh, actually from a mature palm, where you know how much yield it has, uh, to take a, a tiny bit of its spear leaf, of its, if you like, the heart of palm, uh, and uh, uh, propagate it through tissue and literally get up to 50,000 clones from that one hybrid. So potentially, it was a really, really amazing, really amazing te technology. But in the very first plantation uh, that, uh, of clonal palms, uh, they realized that there was, there was some problems. Uh, and we now think of this as somaclonal variation. Uh, but there was one very specific phenotype. You couldn't tell this was going to happen until uh, they produced fruit. Uh, and it's called mantled. Uh, and it completely abolishes yield. So it's a really, really devastating effect, especially when it takes 10 years uh, to produce the fruit bunch, uh, and at that point, it's way too late to cut down uh, the, the palm because you're already in a, in, a, in a canopy and so on. Okay, so uh, this uh, phenotype has become very interesting, uh, and, uh, and a lot of people have studied it over the years. Uh, it actually looks an awful lot like homeotic mutants, uh, which, uh, of course, are very familiar to uh, plant developmental biologists. Specifically, uh, in the, in the uh, mantled fruit, uh, the stamens, the male organs, have been converted into carpels. This is a homeotic transformation. It's exactly like a mutation called deficiens that was originally isolated in antirhinum, and also a petal of three in Arabidopsis, and actually in all plants uh, have this transcription factor gene. And it really looks very, very similar uh, to that mutant. And people thought for a long time that this might be the responsible, but no one was ever able to generate it, uh, to, to demonstrate that. So uh, we set about, and when I say we, I should say this is a company that I'm a co-founder of called Orion Genomics, uh, in collabor very close collaboration with the Malaysian uh, Oil Palm Board, MPOB, uh, specifically with uh, Melina. I know some of you know Melina, uh, who's, been, who's the head of tissue culture and, and uh, cloning there. And what we did was we did an epigenome-wide association study. So rather than looking at SNPs, we looked at DNA methylation. We did it using microarrays. You could easily do it using bisulfite sequencing, but at the time, this was a lot cheaper. Uh, and so we were able to detect DNA methylation across the entire oil palm genome uh, and ask the question, is it associated with the mantle phenotype? 
And to do that, we had amazing uh, material that May uh, collected from, from industry in Malaysia, whoops, come on, uh, uh, which included uh, 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 genetically identical trios. So if you're used to doing human uh, genome-wide association studies, you use trios, right, the parents and the child. In this case, we had uh, an ortet, uh, and then a normal uh, clone from that ortet and a mantled clone from that ortet. So these are three palms, genetically identical, but phenotypically different. And we collected hundreds of these trios uh, and were able to do methylation profiling of all of them. And uh, the, the result that you get is something that looks a lot like a, uh, a GWAS study. So this is, a, this is a Manhattan plot of DNA methylation. Uh, and it was a really, really strong signal. The only signal, I mean, first of all, there's an awful lot going on in tissue culture. There's a lot of methylation changes, like literally tens of thousands in every palm. But there's only one site that's in common in, the, in those trios between all of those hundreds of families. Uh, and and, there, and there, are four, uh, there were four features on the microarray that were all clustered together. Uh, and very satisfyingly, they landed right in the deficiency gene. So it was, in fact, the deficiency gene that was responsible. But it was in an intron, and in fact, it wasn't in the gene itself, it was in the intron, and it was in a transposon uh, that was uh, uh, changing its methylation, and a transposon that already had a name, uh, a very seductive name <laughs> called karma. Uh, and it had been called karma for a very good reason, because in rice, uh, it's also activated by tissue culture. So uh, in rice, uh, actually, there's a transposon mutagenesis system that's, that's uh, been, been used for many years successfully now by Hirochiko Hirohiko and his colleagues. Uh, and, and there's just a handful of transposons that get activated in rice tissue culture. And one of them is karma. And they called it karma precisely because it didn't move until the next generation. Okay? So it was, it, this <laughs> we did not name it karma. This was already, this was already done. But of course, this allowed us to now name the epi alleles a bad karma for the unmethylated epi allele and good karma for the methylated epi allele. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and we did some bisulfite sequencing. And sure enough, it was, very, it was actually quite, quite surprising uh, in a way, but, but really reminiscent of, of what I was telling you about in pollen. So CG methylation doesn't change in the karma element. It's exactly the same whether you're normal or, or the ortet or the mantled. But non-CG methylation of, of, of the RNA-dependent type is completely abolished. So again, this is a reprogramming event that's happened in tissue culture, but without fertilization, it doesn't get restored. And that's why you get this, uh, this, mantled, this mantled phenotype. Uh, in fact, uh, that uh, methylation, and again, I'm not going to get into the mechanism at all, affects splicing. And the reason, uh, which is, sounds weird, but actually this is true in mammalian cells as well, uh, DNA methylation, when it's lost from the karma element, opens up a splice site, a splice acceptor site, which results in a truncated form of the deficiency uh, protein, which is actually a dominant negative, and this has been shown in other plants uh, very, very well. And this happens at exactly the stage of, of uh, floral development that you would, you would expect it to. Uh, and, of course, uh, given that we now know uh, that the splicing is the important thing, this is the splice site here, we could now develop a very simple DNA methylation test that predicts, literally, karma, <laughs> good karma or bad karma, uh, a test that you can apply to a seedling before you put it in the plantation. And that allows you to weed out all of those uh, uh, mantled, the palms that are destined to become mantled with a simple DNA test. You can use restriction enzymes, uh, which gives you a pretty, good, uh, a pretty good test, but bisulfite sequencing is even better. And these days, you can do this sort of assay in literally millions and millions of them with uh, Illumina or whatever. And so this is a very, a very powerful and predictive test. Uh, and uh, 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 we, can, we can demonstrate that methylation is responsible for the phenotype uh, with these rare but very nice uh, revertants where we see mixed uh, 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 fruits, which are partially mantled, uh, and, uh, and when this happens, DNA methylation is restored. Uh, this was all published a little while ago, but uh, you, you can see in these two uh, revertants here, uh, DNA methylation comes back, whereas in this uh, uh, lineage without reversion, it, it doesn't. So it is possible to revert the phenotype, and this was actually one reason why it was thought to be epigenetic. When it was first discovered, ironically, by, by May's grandfather, actually, he's also... <laughs> It was, he sadly passed away. He was, he was also a famous oil palm geneticist, and he was the first person to notice mantled and to suggest it was epigenetic because of this reversion uh, effect.
Uh, you're probably thinking, what happens to small RNAs? Well, amazingly, it looks exactly like Arabidopsis. So in oil palm tissue culture now, uh, uh, we see exactly that shift from 24s to 21s. Exactly the same shift in easy RNAs that we saw in pollen, and exactly the same shift that we saw in cell culture in Arabidopsis. So this seems to be a really important reprogramming event, and it's associated with the loss of DNA methylation of the RNA-dependent uh, non-CG uh, kind. Uh, so we're very interested in trying to get to, uh, to, to grips with the biology of this to try and you know, control somaclonal variation at the source. Uh, and you could imagine, for example, transfecting these cell cultures of small RNAs, you know, all sorts of things that you could do uh, to, uh, to address this. It also led to, uh, you know, my favorite cover, uh, at least recently, uh, which was, uh, uh, this, they actually came up with this title, we didn't come up with it, but Weed Out Bad Karma. So, uh, so this, uh, this simple DNA test uh, is now commercialized, uh, it has real world implications, uh, so a lot of the uh, companies in Malaysia are now testing to see whether, you know, they can now generate clean plantations that never, never get mantled. Uh, and, and, and that's uh, an ongoing development between uh, MPOB, the Malaysian Palm Oil Board, and, and Orion Genomics, uh, the company uh, that I was telling you about, they're based in St. Louis, uh, but also now in Kuala Lumpur, and also in, in Indonesia. Uh, of course, uh, you know, oil palm has, a, uh, has, a, has an interesting reputation. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's uh, come under extreme, uh, you know, uh, controversy because of its competition with the rainforest. This is a picture that May took from a helicopter uh, over, over Borneo. On the left is the oldest rainforest on Earth, at least that's what they say. Uh, it hasn't been inundated for 100 million years, and so it really is a very old rainforest. And on the right is an oil palm plantation, and you sort of get the idea. <laughs> this is bad. Uh, since the 1990s, there's been a moratorium on burning down the rainforest and increasing uh, 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 plantations, but that moratorium has been uh, weakly enforced, and you have to admit that for a smallholder farmer, he plants some clones, up comes a mantled palm, this is really horrible. So why not burn down the neighboring rainforest and plant some more uh, rather than you know, uh, 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 paying for more seed? And so uh, uh, we're hoping that this sort of test, and we have other tests for other sorts of genetic uh, changes, will, will really help the smallholder in Malaysia uh, be able to have a more robust and more reproducible uh, uh, crop uh, uh, in, in, in this very important uh, uh, source of, of oil. I mean, oil palm produces half the world's edible oil, and so this is, not, uh, this is, this is an equation that we have to solve. We can't uh, just let it go. Okay, so just to summarize, easy RNAs are triggered by microRNAs. They come from active transposons. Reprogramming in pollen activates the transposons in a sort of, uh, a sort of uh, strategy to fool them into making these small RNAs uh, which then accumulate in sperm. And amazingly, these small RNAs are responsible uh, for the triploid block, uh, which uh, is common to, uh, to many, many angiosperms, as I said. Uh, DNA methylation is reprogrammed in pollen, but not the same way as in mammals. CG methylation doesn't change, but uh, asymmetric DNA methylation, RNA-dependent DNA methylation, is reprogrammed. Uh, if you don't do that, if you, if, you, if you lose that methylation but don't fertilize uh, in clones, then you start to get these epigenetic abnormalities uh, controlled by small RNAs in just the same way. And, uh, and, 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 and I like to say that this is not just an academic uh, issue, it's something that really matters uh, to uh, somaclonal variation. Lots of people to thank. Uh, the people whose work I talked about, uh, very importantly, Keith Slotkin, he has his own lab in uh, Ohio State, he's actually just moving to the Danforth uh, in St. Louis. Uh, also Milos, he has his own group now in Queensland uh, at uh, QUT. Uh, Rowan uh, just moved back to New Zealand. Uh, Philippe uh, just moved to Paris. And yes, I am looking for postdocs, <laughs> just to let you know. But, uh, uh, and and uh, I think I mentioned also Kate and uh, Joe uh, and Mark, who did all the uh, original work on pollen reprogramming in Arabidopsis. Very importantly, the Malaysian uh, Palm Oil Board, uh, too many people to mention, but May is the head of tissue culture and, and, uh, and cloning. Uh, Raj uh, is the head of genetics. He's an amazing uh, plant breeder. Uh, and Ravi uh, is, was at the time the head of the whole, the whole shooting match, and she's been my uh, sort of partner in crime over there in Malaysia for a long time. And Orion, uh, Jared is the head of research, Steve the head of informatics, and Nate is our, is our uh, chief, chief executive officer, and, and, and we had this picture taken in celebration of the oil palm uh, 
genome some time ago, and, and uh, there's Ravi, and that's Nate. So, thank you very much. I'm